Friday evening presentation. some fun things, um, the what ifs, um, the Model A production, I don't know if anybody, how many people have seen a Model A or a picture of them, the, the low wing tri-motor and the retractable landing gear, it was really a, a, a advanced airplane, it had an airfoil section, it was very fast, that Stinson didn't use on any of their aircraft, I'm really amazed at that. Uh, the Department of Commerce uh, issued a call for a that small twin-engine, all-metal twin-engine, small transport. Um, they were building Model A's from 34 to 37, and Beach responded with the Model 18. Lockheed uh, come out in 38 with the Model 12, then they got off to building P-38s. And if Stinson would have decided to, they had the engineering department, they had the factory, and they had the, uh, had the, uh, the uh, manufacturing staff that they could have built an airplane that would have been similar to um, the Beach 18. It would have changed the history of the company. But they elected not to do that. Why? I'm not sure. Um, they had the Model R was the last one of the, uh, that Eddie Stinson's had anything to do with. And they built three of them with retractable landing gears. They uh, had a stub wing and the gear retracted up. They built actually three of these and flew them. In fact, they had a type certificate number on it. Um, they were building uh, these in, in, in 32. Uh, Beach didn't come out of the Stagger Wing Beach until 34, 35. Actually, with the retractable landing gear, if they'd have brought that up to speed, they could have competed with the Stagger Wing Beach, and they elected not to, not to do that. But it was, I think it would have been interesting if since it went into the retractable landing gear, uh, business. We'll talk a little bit about Jack Stinson, uh, Eddie's brother. Now, I didn't write him only into one chapter, the Greyhound chapter, and we'll talk about the Greyhound airplane that they built. Um, he was a, had an interesting life. He started flying schools, went broke, got sued. Um, uh, he was never part of the Northville or the Wayne, Michigan company. Although he had a flying school and did some things in Detroit at the time, but I have no record of him ever being on that. The rumor has it that Catherine raised his son. Now he had a son who wasn't ever involved in aviation, but he farmed in Nebraska. And I have the name of the town, but I don't have it with me here. Uh, but his grandson, Jack's grandson, become a, an executive with Bill Helicopters and Lycoming Engines, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, the, something was big in the 30s, from 1925 to 31, there was Ford Motor Company, 
had reliability tours. There's a couple of books out on it. Um, I followed them. Um, Eddie Stinson flew in the Pathfinder book in, in 25, and he was in, flew in 26, 27, and in the 28 one, I did a chapter on this. There were three Stinsons flew in that. They, they placed third, fifth, and sixth. But the interesting thing about this, there was um, a lady by name, I think it's, I pronounce it, uh, Phoebe Omelie approached Estelle Stinson, that his wife, that she would she fly with him in the tour. Eddie was flying a, an airplane with some people in it, a Stinson. Uh, a Model 70 monocoupe. I don't know how many people have ever seen a Model 70 monocoupe. It's a really petite little two-place airplane. It had a 55 horse little radial engine in it. Uh, very, very small. These two were living, flew in this. Uh, they were out 31 days. They went from Detroit to California, up the California coast, across the, the Montana, Dakotas, back to Detroit. A um, couple things they did. They were flying into, flying into West Texas and Mora, I think it's a, it's a, a military base, and Phoebe came in a little hot. There was a hot day and there's wind, and she turned off a little fast and rolled the thing over its back. Well, this is the first time a cell had ever been on an airplane in its back. I don't know how many, how many people have been on a, an airplane upside down, hanging, holding on with a, their seat belts. And she said, well, what do we do now? And Omelie said, well, pull your feet up your, your feet up close to the seat, put your hand on the ceiling, which would be down, and before you pop the seat belts. When they get out, they walked on the bottom part of the wing and poked holes in the bottom part of the wing getting out. Um, a, a fellow that was a, a monocoupe dealer was flying another 70, lit beside them, and uh, uh, got out and said, why don't you just get my airplane and fly on? I'll, I'll fix this airplane. It wasn't damaged that bad. Um, and he, he repaired it. They flew up the California coast, run out of gas once, lit on the beach. They, the, the, these two women had quite a thing. They got in Montana, and Eddie had lit before and, and locked his airplane. They put their luggage in his big Simpson, and they just, they couldn't get in. They didn't have the keys. They just barred a screwdriver and pried the door open. Oh. And when Eddie complained about it, they said, well, we thought about just cutting the fabric and taking the suitcases out to the side. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but the Ford reliability tours, Stinson participated in them and did very well. Um, we're talking about the Greyhound. Now the Greyhound was built in 1920. Uh, the interesting thing, and we, the Stinson Club and Vintage Aviation decided to use this as the, the 1920 for the 100th anniversary of Stinson. Um, for Oshkosh a year ago, of course they didn't have it, but they built this one airplane, and we'll talk about that, and then they didn't build any more airplanes until 1926, but he did this one. Uh, Ed and his family and his mother, his brother Jack and his mother Emma, uh, headquartered out of Dayton, Ohio, and Eddie decided to build an airplane. Now he'd dabbled some airplanes before, um, and he laid out the basic design. It was a little two-place biplane, two-place side-by-side biplane. Uh, it was just one stick uh, in it, and uh, um, but you sat side-by-side. -side. Um, Jack was there, and he had access to a whole junkyard full of Jenny parts. Now, there was no Curtis parts in the airplane, except they had hinges and cables and controls and instruments and everything that he had access to the, all this parsley part of the, the, the junkyard. Uh, Eddie was running a traveling uh, air show and doing uh, barnstorming without making money and he commissioned Jack to build the airplane but Eddie would fly in and supervise it. So Jack put the airplane together. The first flight was in 19, January 1st, 1920. In March 10th, 1920, Eddie he had a mechanic the mechanic was traveling with him on these air shows. It's kind of interesting. They were out in barnstorming. There, was, there were two or three of them were flying together. Sometimes they did events at county fairs, and um, they had their mechanic with them all the time. I thought that was rather interesting. So he took his mechanic with him, and they flew to a, an air show a, um, where they were presenting airplanes to the public. 
in New York. Um, they didn't get any, they, uh, Jack and his mother, Emma, had great ideas that they could market this airplane. But Eddie never sold an airplane at the show. He flew down to uh, uh, old Philadelphia, and a magazine called Aero Age Weekly did a story on the airplane, and he showed it to people, and he just didn't had any takers. The problem was it wasn't quite advanced enough to be ahead of anybody else. It was a nice little airplane. So he started back home March 10, 1920, with his mechanic. And the stick broke off the famous story at the attached point. And so then he was flying it with just the throttle and the rudder. Now, I have tried that. Uh, you go out and take your airplane and get it up in the air and uh, take your hands off the controls and fly with just the rudder and the throttle. And that gets really interesting really quick. I, I'm not just sure how he did it, how he lit it. There's some speculation um, how, he, how he had a control crash. Um, some people thought that he closed the throttle, used full rudder, and just spiraled it down. But that's, uh, there's a newspaper account that it looked like the airplane almost come straight down. He didn't spin it, I don't think. But anyhow, they survived the crash. Um, the, the, the crash was close to, um, oh, where are we at here? Um, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Anyhow, he abandoned the thing. He was making money running the air show. Then he used to give the airplane to Jack. Jack recovered the airplane, took it back to uh, home, rebuilt it, and flew it for several years, wrecked it once, and then he sold it. Uh, in 1926, he sold it, and it was licensed NC-2554. Uh, uh, the, early, but, but the early Greyhound, and during that time, you didn't have to have license numbers on your airplanes, and so they licensed it. It was sold and went to California, and I don't know if they flew it to California or was trucked to California, and they re-licensed it at uh, NC-352V, Victor, and then the... the the, the registration was canceled in 1933. So the airplane survived, uh, and, and Jack flew it uh, several years after the, after the famous wreck. Um, moving on, we'll talk a little bit about the early years. They had what they called the Detroiters. There's very few of them flying, very few ever, ever saw one of these. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the later ones, the Reliance. Um, in January 32, Eddie, of course, was killed in an accident in, in, in um, January of 32. Cord, uh, from Cord Cars, he, had the, he owned controlling interest in the factory at that time. And he or, um, completely reorganized the company, had a whole new uh, organization. And in January 33, two people from the Greenville Brothers um, Racing Factory, they designed the GB Racers. Now the big round of the engine with the people sitting the back of the tail. These two uh, gentlemen designed those racers. Um, Greenville Brothers was in financial trouble and they showed up at Wayne and applied for a job. Uh, Robert Hall with a master's degree in engineering and Robert Ayer, a graduate from Harvard Engineering University. And the um, new management decided that they would commission them to design a new airplane. The Model R was a, was a good airplane, um, and they sold several of them, but the new management decided, we need a new, a, a new aircraft. And they, the company also hired an artist, or they called him a, an industrial stylist. And this, as the story goes, the two engineers sat down with the artist, and they'd say, we think the airplane ought to look like this, and he would sketch it out on a piece of tissue paper. And they said, oh, no, we'd think it ought to look like this. And so, and then he would, uh, uh, Skinner, would, the uh, artist, would sketch in paint trims so, so from a marketing standpoint. And when they got the airplane, when he had a design that they thought, this is real, we like the looks of, this will sell, then they 
develop an airplane around that picture. Uh, and that's where the reliance come from. But they, 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 from a marketing standpoint, they wanted an airplane that looked good, and then they knew they could do the, the design work. The Reliant went into production in 1933. Um, in 1933, this was in the depth of the Depression. Um, if you listen to uh, national public television, they'd think that everybody was selling apples off the street. But there was a lot of money in, through the Depression. And I did a little research as I went through this. Uh, prior to the crash in 27, 28, Ford was selling about a million five hundred cars. Chevy was selling about a million five hundred cars. And during the height of the Depression in 32, 33, 34, they were selling about 500,000 cars. So they were selling cars. They was, people, somebody had money out there to buy a Ford or a Chevy. Now Packers were selling cars, but the Ford and the Chevys. Um, so there was, there, was, there was money out there uh, for about airplanes. And so they come out with the first of the Reliance, you know, with the landing gear that's out. They were straight winged. They were the SR1, SR2, SR3. And the first year they sold 109 of them. Uh, that's 1933, and that was a, really the depth of the Depression. Um, in 34, oh, they were building trimotors, a Model A trimotor, and they sold uh, six Model A trimotors in 30. 33 and 34, they sold 173 uh, single engine, um, they call them the SR5s, they sold four trimotors, but in 1933 was the first ones that had flaps. They didn't call them flaps, they called them speed reducers. They didn't create lift, but they really improve your uh, descent if you're trying to make a steep descent. Uh, they, they were the first ones that had, had wing flaps. Um, 35, they sold 60 airplanes, SR6, and 18 trimotors. They were too busy building trimotors that I suspect that the dealers were complaining about this. Um, the, um, what did I say, 35, SR6. 36, they sold 183 single engine airplane. Um, the SR7, that was the first of the gull wings. We'll talk a little about that. The gull wing, they didn't know what to call it. Somebody showed up at the factory, as the story goes, and said, that looks like a, it looks like a gull wing, and the, and the name stuck. But they hadn't really given it a name. But now in the Model A trimotor, they took the wings f from the outboard engines to the engines, and then they lowered, the, tapered the, the wing down to the bottom of the fuselage, then put wing struts, two struts up on the structure on the top. And the reason they did that was that then the cabin would, we wouldn't have to crawl over a, a, a big spar through the cabin. And you're getting some of these, like the Beach 18, and some of these you, you get in the airplane, and you have to go step over this spar, and it goes through the cabin. They said, well, we can eliminate that. So they had a really a nice cabin with the floor clear to the front by tapering the wing down and then putting the struts on top. They had two braces. It looks, I thought they looked, it was, it was really not very obvious if you see one that the braces go to the top. And they got to looking about this and said, why can't we do this same type of thing on the, on the Reliant and we can start with where the attach points are bring the wing out like this and then taper it back. And they designed it as a marketing ploy. ploy. Uh, they thought, thought this would give them a new look for an airplane. And so the, uh, they come out in, in, in 36 with the, with the gull wings, and they built 183 gull wings. Um, uh, and 12 trimotor aircraft, so they were, the factory was busy. In 37, they built 195 the SR9s, and that was the last of the trimotors in 37, they built two. 38, they come out with the SR10, and they, you, you use the SR10s from then on to the end of production. Um, they weren't selling that much, they were getting quite expensive, and they just continued to build the SR10s, the different versions of it. 
um, 39, and they sold um, 35 Reliance. 40, they sold um, what did they sell? 40. Seven. They only sold seven Reliance, but they come out with the uh, three-place airplane, the 105. Uh, we've seen them. They, 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 this is the first one. And, and we've talked about this before. They had spin troubles with uh, when they come out with their first uh, three-place. Uh, they had did flat spins, and they, they had a lot of struggle with this. How do you... How do they control the, the, the spin? They about give up on the design, and a fellow by the name of Albert Schramm, he was a test pilot, suggested, he said, it takes a lot more up elevator to do a three-point landing than you need a level flight. They had fl wing flaps on them, so they uh, uh, put a stop in, and, and this is true in, on your 108s, the same thing. Um, and when you're in level flight and the wing flaps are up, you can't pull the control back as far. You lower the flaps, the, the, the stop goes down, and you get more elevator. Then they sold this to the CAA and they certified the airplane and it went into production. They built a, a 238 three place um, in 1940. 1941, they sold 10 Reliance and 553 place airplanes, that was a, the 10A, and you've all seen the 10A was the, the one they built the most of. And um, that was the last of the civilian Reliant airplane was in 40, 41. In 42, uh, they just started building the L5, they built 10 of them, but they built f 1,533 pairs of wing panels for the Volte, uh, a31 dive bomber they was building in um, Nashville, and they built these um, wing panels and they shipped them down. I'm not sure they put them on rail track. Or rail I have no idea how they shipped them, um, but they, the 42 was their uh, year. Then they went into L5 production. Um, in 45, um, they built. Um, they continued to build. L5 through the war, and, and in 1945, they thought about starting uh, uh, 108 production in Nashville again, and they built 10 airplanes. The serial number one through 10 uh, was built in Nashville, and then they decided to, to open up the line in, in, in Detroit. Um, we'll talk just a little bit about production figures. Um, Civilian round engine Simpsons, and this would be the the Detroiters and the Reliance. I have it. They built about 18, 1,875. They built 500 of the V77s. Uh, L5s, they built 3,000, um, Tri-motors, they built 121 of all the different models. Um, 108 production was 5,249. They had built 16 prototypes. Some went into production, some didn't. Uh, the total production from uh, 1926 and 1948, 12,710 uh, airplanes. That's quite a few airplanes, that, their total production of airplanes. And they had 124 type certificates. Now, if anybody knows anything about how hard it is to get a type certificate through the uh, FAA today, um, it must have been easier then to have type certificates because they did 124 of them. Uh, an interesting note, the New York City Police Department bought um, two S SR-10s in 39 and one of them was still flying in Canada. Um, one of the things that they did when they come out with the tri-motor airplanes, their first prototype, um, they decided that they needed to re-engineer it, and they sold it. They sold it to a bootlegger, and he flew booze around, had a forced landing in a cornfield, and then it caught on fire, and the booze all burned up. 
which we did a little story on that. A little bit, to finish up here a little bit about Eddie Simpson, he was more than a pilot. He was born in 1893 and passed away in 1932. He, he graduated in the eighth grade. But Eddie was interesting. He had a really a strong worth ethic. He was an excellent pilot and, and a wonderful salesman. He had a little drinking problem. There's some stories about that. And, but it didn't, seem to fly, it didn't seem to affect his ability to fly. Today they would uh, frown on that, I think. Uh, but he had a little problem managing his personal finances. And after he married Estelle, uh, she was really surprised that he had about $3,000 of the stories told in a leather bag in the back of his airplane. He was out making money, uh, $3,000 in, in I'm not sure just when they were married, was quite a bit of money. So she took over the, the business end of the company. Uh, and she, when he started doing the charter work, she ran the, the business end of it, seen the bills were paid, and they made money, and they were, they were very profitable. He was out, he was a promoter, and he was selling airplanes. Now she helped him develop the, the first airplane that they, they built in Northville. Um, he was discharged from the Army as a second lieutenant in, in, in 1919. And between 1919 and 1926, he, he was busy doing things. He uh, first he set a record of with a, with a passenger 22 consecutive loops. Oh. Now I uh, oh. I don't know how many people have put an airplane through a loop. I uh, was only in one once. It was a J3. It was a long time ago, and he dived it to get speed up. They come over the top, and we stalled on the top. Everything in the bottom bolts and dirt and everything fell down on our head, and then we just kind of made an E and come back. Uh, I've never tried one since, uh, but. Um, 22 with a pasture. Then he set a record of 58 loops by himself. And then he, in 1919, he set another record of 143 loops. Um, I what just. Are, what airplane was that in? Uh, it was. Oh, it wasn't a Stinson. Um, I don't know okay. uh, what, what, he was, what he was flying when he set the, set the record. Um, he worked for the Jasperi Gyroscope Company. He worked for the Quick Start Gasoline Company, which I thought was kind of an interesting name. He barnstormed, had a flying circus. He um, made two trips to Mexico. He worked for the Mexican Army once and was promoted to the, the, the rank of general. Apparently it didn't last very long. And then in 1922, he went down and helped him start an airline. And uh, he came back. Um, he um, continued his charter service while they were building the airplanes at Northville until Cord come down and finance it. Um, anyhow, this this concerns includes my story. Is there any questions? Anybody who'd like to? Yes. John, the uh, different models you went through, the different SRs, were those different airframes or just different engine combinations? No, they, they, they really made quite a few changes. I have a, a sheet here of all of the changes, and each year they would make quite a few changes. Um, improve them, uh, change the windows, they, they change the, the windows quite a little bit, change the window design, uh, change the interior, sometimes they change the instrument panels, uh, sometimes they would beef them up, they make the cabin a little longer. Uh, each year there was, noticeable changes between, um, as you're looking down through these, um, you know, from the, and like the, the flaps on, uh, they, uh, when they got ready to do the, in 1935, they sh shortened the wings up and, 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 and do a different airfoil. So there was there were changes. I can they they were and, and they would have a different model like an SR five A XR B C D E F and that they would be different power plants. Um, some of them would have two doors. Some of them would have uh, more fuel. So each year they 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 were considerably different between each year. Uh, some parts were interchangeable, but but many parts were were different.
said, but I'll, you can look at my, I'll, I'll show you the sheet okay. uh, of where they did. Anybody else look at it? John, I've got a question. The Stenson L1, uh, I'm assuming the predecessor to the L5, um, was that more consolidated or was that Stenson that built that one? The, the one that's kind of a slow takeoff and landing one? It's a ra radial engine, yes. yes. Stinson <coughs> developed that and built a few uh, while they were in, say they went to Nashville in 40 and 41, and then they moved back to Detroit, and Stinson was still running the factor at Nashville for a while, and I, have, I can tell you how many they built of those. Um, they claimed it was a Stinson. They designed the airplane and was still running. They built a hundred and um, hmm, three hundred and twenty-four of them. Um, they were high wing. They had a full um, uh, slats in the front that opened and closed. They had f uh, foiler type flaps. Then they could land and take off with a little wind almost, could stop almost instantly. Uh, they were kind of weird looking things, but they, uh, but Stinson claimed they designed it and they built most of them, but most of them were built in Nashville. You listed a bunch of the production numbers like for the B-77, how many they built every year, it was a couple hundred this year. And then they, they, they built. So my, my question is, did they build them to order? Or did they have a production run and sell them? Well, see, the V-77, the Stinson uh, presented the SR-10 to the Air Force as an executive plane or a trainer, and the Air Force said, this isn't beefed up enough. So Stinson got busy and then developed the V-77. Now, the, the, all the reliance, the landing gear comes out, and then there's a leg goes down where your, your axle is. On the V-77, the landing gear goes out, just like your stences today on the landing gear. The axle is right at the end of the landing gear. And they beefed them up considerably. Um, they presented them to the Air Force, and the Air Force, Army Air Force still didn't want them. Well, Consolidated had a big lobbying force in uh, Washington, and they approached the British to sell them under Lynn Lease. Then British they said, yes, we'll take them. So they leased a contract for 250 of them. Um, and uh, they were all shipped to England. They were shipped all over. Uh, 25 or 30 of them. I have some numbers in the book. There was, they put them on, they crated them in New, in New York, the, the first batch of 250. They crated them and put them with top cargo on anything, put them on tankers, they put them on anything, they just stuck them on in the crate. And the Germans submarines were sinking ships, and about 23 or 4 of them, quite a few of them, maybe more than that, was, went down in the Atlantic because the ships they were on was torpedoed by uh, German submarines. And then they came back and did another 250, so they actually built 500 of them. Um, a few of them went to Canada, a few went to the Navy, but the majority of them all went to, to Canada. And then they came back after the war, uh, and the Lynn Lease, when the war was over, England just shipped them all back, the ones that survived, and then they sold them and licensed them as, as civilian aircraft. Um, John, when Cord took control of the company, uh, did it help it sustain it, or did it give it a new life, or what, what, how did that work out? Well, um, somebody made an approach, and I, um, approach Cord, um, they were out, they, they sold him an airplane, he, or he was a multimillionaire, and they were talking about that, that they were selling these for um, 
um, airlines, the startup airlines, and they were, were selling them. He became very interested and decided that maybe he would like to uh, uh, develop his own airline business and he'd need an airplane to, to build them. Um, and so they, that's an interesting story. They had a small corporation in, in Northville, Michigan, and somebody's going to talk about that this afternoon or tomorrow, the Northville factory. But they, Cord, uh, talked to him about it and said, uh, I'd like to buy your stock. Uh, and he would put it, he'd finance it. And they approached him with a stock option. It was just before the, the, the crash of 29, and uh, they couldn't get together. After the crash of 29, in December 29, where it was, they came back and uh, they approached him, and he bought all the, the stints of stock. And he, put, it's put in, he just put in uh, thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, they financed the new factory in, in, in uh, Wayne. Uh, they gave them money to, they, they developed the first trimotor uh, to get it into production. So they give them money. Uh, he uh, owned Lycoming. Lycoming was building uh, automobile engines for the automobile industry. Then he went back to Lycoming and said, you will build an aircraft engine and you'll sell it to Stinson very inexpensively. So Lycoming built an engine, the first engines, and was sold to Stinson. They, built, they were excellent engines, nothing wrong with them. And, but the, he said, you will sell them to Stinson at your cost. So this really made Stinson really competitive with the, with the, with the Lycoming engines. Uh, uh, but he, f there's a, he and he had a kind of a um, holding company with several investors in it, to it, and they had control of Stinson. Uh, but he put the initial money in. He put in his th he helped them finance the factory, set it up to develop the first trimotor, and put them into production. Uh, they wouldn't at the, the small factory would never have been able to produce airplanes if Cord hadn't invested the money in it. Um, I don't know, does that answer the question? Who, I don't know where that came from. Yeah. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. Thanks, John. Appreciate that uh, very informative uh, talk on uh, some of the history of Stinson. Um, one of the things for, uh, I guess, all the, the new folks here, if it's your first time, we seem to solve lots and lots of problems on the balcony of the hotel after this, okay? And it's a BYB, but... Uh, uh, anyways, you go up the stairs and turn to the right and go to the end of the hall and uh, there's the, the, the porch, uh, what we call, uh, that uh, lots of good discussion will go on.